Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Foothills Church Online. My name is Jordan Fuller. Hey, I'm Sharon Nicholson. Hey, we're excited to spend a new Sunday morning with you. We're continuing our sermon series, The Bible Explained, which has been awesome yeah. to get into the practical applications of the Bible, maybe some of the history mm. of the Bible and how it applies to our lives today. But it's going to be a good Sunday, and we're excited that you're joining us here. Yes, and if this is your first Sunday, we just want to say welcome. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with us. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to know that you're tuning in. So head over to foothills.cc slash connect. Drop your email address there for us, and we would love to get a free gift sent over to your inbox. And that's just a way to say thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for tuning in. We would love to connect um, throughout the week. We'd love to see you inside the walls one day. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming and hanging out. Yeah. Yep, guys, and as always, we have a team of chat moderators, of people who are ready to pray with you to answer any questions you might have. But we're excited that you're joining us today. And we want to tell you a little bit about what we've got coming yeah. up here at Foothills. And I want to remind you, there's so much that we cover in these shows, in these pre-shows, and we do it in announcements mm -hmm. on, on stage as well, that you can't follow all of it. We know that you can't follow all of it. I can't follow all of it. But if you go to foothills.cc slash events, you'll have all the events that are coming up, all the information that you need. But we want to tell you about a handful of things that we got going on today or this coming season here yeah, at right. Foothills. Yeah. The first is next Sunday, October 9th, right here at Foothills. Baptism Sunday. Always a party. Always a party. It's always a celebration. And if you've given your life to Jesus and you're looking to take that next step, baptism is your next step. We want to partner with you. We want to celebrate with you. And that happens next Sunday. You can still register online at Foothills dot cc slash baptism or on the vince page you can find your way there as well absolutely and something else that we have coming up soon is love where you live so if you're familiar with servo coney this is our rebranded version of that so as you may know we are going to be um joining or actually opening a new campus absolutely. in pendleton and so that is outside of oconee county so we can't call it servo coney anymore so we have changed the name to love where you live we are so thankful that we're getting to go outside of Oconee. But let me tell you a little bit more about this. This is where we get to go out in our community, love on those in our community through whether it's trash pickup or making bird feeders or painting. There's a little bit of everything. Everything. I feel like. And so it's so much fun. You can bring your kids along with you. It's for a few hours in the morning. And it's just our way to go out and love on those in our community um, and just show them the love of Jesus. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be even bigger impact than what has been before we're going outside the walls of Oconee County yeah. and, and it's just going to be a great thing that we want you to be involved with but another outreach opportunity for children and families here it's one of the biggest things we do for children and families each year here at Foothills and it's trunk or treat it's happening obviously October 31st yes. right here at Foothills um, we're collecting candy donations right mm -hmm. now. So you can drop that in the concourse. You can bring it by the church offices. And if you're a part of our church, you're, you're a part of the volunteer team. We are looking for people to volunteer for trunks as well. And you can find out all that information, again, online at foothills.cc slash events. But it's always a fun time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And two requirements. You have to bring the good candy and you have to have a really cool idea for your trunk. What's, what's like an old old person you know an old person candy i'm sorry if you're old and oh, watching and you give out the old yeah yeah where like, there's you originals want a caramel like <laughs> yeah. you want a caramel no, or a tootsie that's... roll or whatever <laughs> yeah i none remember of that. like none the snicker the full size snicker bars you were like yes yeah. this is the way Reese to go cups those are there go it's good yeah. bring the good candy be a part of trunk or treat <laughs> on october 31st yeah and it's about time for service to start thank you guys for hanging out this long grab your bibles grab your coffee and we will see you back here after the message see ya There is no shadow Come on. that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won.
Good morning, Foothills family. How y'all doing this morning? Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Yes, amen. You may be seated. If you haven't met me yet, I'm Rod Smith, one of the pastors here on campus. So good to have you this morning. Can we give a big Foothills welcome to our first-time guest this morning? Come on, you welcome them this morning. Yes, yes. We're so glad to have you this morning. I want to invite you to our guest room right in the cons. Uh, concourse as you exit on the left. We got a free gift for you just to say thank you for your visit this morning. You can get a chance to meet our volunteers, our co-lead pastors, Pastor Greg and Pastor Kevin. We have a short conversation with you. And again, just to say thank you this morning. How many know fall season is in full effect, right? Yes, we got a lot of activities going on, a lot of events, but I do want to mention this. Go to foothills.cc slash events Check out all the fall calendar. Find out what's going on. But I do want to mention a few things. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. Give it up, right? That is our, yes. So if you made a decision for Christ, baptism is your next step. In the concourse, we got a sign-up table. We got volunteers there to get you signed up and made that next step in baptism. Also, October the 29th, we have Love Where You Live. That's our community outreach. This is uh, an endeavor where we get outside of four walls and go serve our communities. So on October the 23rd, we have a sign-up day with different activities. This is a great part. We got activities in Oconee County, and now we got something in Pickens County, right? So we stretch it out. Yes, yes. So again, the 23rd, come Sunday. After the, after the second service, come sign up. Find an event in your area. We want to love where we live. We want to serve our community. And also, 
October 31st, our annual trunk or treat drive through right here on campus. Yes, we're going to have plenty of candy, plenty of kids. Now, if you go to the event page, click on the link, you can register your car and decorate it. Now, I got some ideas about decorating our family car, but I don't know. I have to talk to the wife and see what we can come up with. But listen, this is going to be great. There's so many people in this community, we're going to get a chance to bless them through Trunk or Treat. So again, that's going to be on the 31st. Be a part of that. It's going to be great. So today, after the second service, we have our Foothills Pillington Interest Meeting. This is, yes, yes, it's going to be great, yes. You get a chance to hear from Pastor Joseph Bennett, hear some vision. Now, God has a plan. We want you to be a part of that. So come to the meeting. We got, we got lunch covered, child care is covered. We want to invite you after the second service. You can go run some errands, come back, and be a part of this meeting. It's going to be right in the venue right after the second service. Church, all this is possible because of your generosity. Give yourself a hand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for giving to the vision. Thank you so much. I want to remind you three ways you can give. You can give online at foothills.cc slash give. You can give through the mobile app. And also you can put your envelopes in the white box as you exit. I'm asking you to stand. And we're going to pray as we enter back into worship. Father, we thank you. I thank you for this great church family right here. Thank you for everything you provided for us. Father, we pray for all those that have been affected through the hurricane. We pray for strength. We pray for comfort for them, Father God. We're grateful. Um, we, didn't, um, we didn't get any rain this weekend, but we know people are suffering. But, Lord, we bless them. Father, thank you for this great faith family. Thank you for what you're doing in this church. Father, we love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
until he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. Lord, we just thank you. We just stand in gratitude for what you did on that day, Lord. When you made darkness flee, when you, you made death flee. And now it makes whatever is going on in our lives outside of these four walls, it makes it seem so small, Lord, because you hold the victory. You've won the battle. Every battle that we faced in the past and every battle that we will see, we can stand on the promise that you have already won, Lord. And it is in you alone that we can all claim the victory. We be with Kevin as he spreads the message this morning. We thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're going to do this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Foothills, what's going on? It's lively in the house. Can we say thanks to the worship team? That was awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. I'm excited today to continue our conversation about the Bible. And I found an interesting study a few weeks ago where they polled 40,000 people between the ages of 8 and 80 to figure out the impact that the Bible had on people's lives. And what they found was really interesting. They found that if somebody dug into the Bible or read the Bible one time a week, that their life was no different than someone who didn't read the Bible at all. And typically those that said they would read it one time a week made up a lot of Christians who just open the Bible when they attend church on Sunday. Maybe they hear the pastor saying, hey, we're going to open to the book of John today, and that'd be their one dose of the Bible for the week. They found that those that dug into the Bible two times a week also didn't really have any difference in their life. Three times a week, they started to see a trend, but there was some type of breakthrough when someone would open the Bible four times a week, they saw some crazy changes in key areas of people's lives. I'm gonna throw some statistics on the screen so that we can see. Feelings of loneliness dropped for these individuals by 30%. Feelings of loneliness dropped by 30%. And this is, keep in mind, this is reading. I have a lot of introverted friends that love to read, and they would not describe that books make them feel less lonely. It tells you something special about this book being different. Anger issues dropped by 32%. Some of you just made sure your spouse is listening. <laughs> Bitterness in relationships dropped by 40%. Maybe you should have been listening. Bitterness drop. Gets a little more serious here. Alcoholism dropped by 57% for those that dug into the Bible four times a week. Sex outside of marriage dropped by 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped by 60%. Viewing pornography dropped by 61%. Sharing your faith jumped up by 200% and discipling someone else jumped up by 230 percent. Simply put, regularly studying the Bible will transform and benefit your life. Let me say it again. 
The Bible claims that that's the case, but we can actually study people and see this to be true. Regularly studying the Bible will transform and benefit your life. In 1 Timothy 4.8, it says this, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. This is one of, this is not one of, this is an incredible, the best habit that you can have of all the habits in your life. That word godliness in the original text means God likeness. And what the Bible is, is it's a book written about who God is and how we can have a relationship with him, how we can learn who our God is and become like him. We build that godliness by regularly getting into the word. There are all kinds of habits that can benefit our lives. There are habits with physical training, as, as Paul mentioned in 1 Timothy. We can exercise, we can focus on our diet and eating healthy. You can even have habits of reading other material, reading books to help you with your finances or with your leadership or whatever industry that you are in. There is habits you can have with relationships. We know how key community can be. There's habits of attending church. Many of you are here today because you're developing this habit of attending church. All incredible habits, all good things, but they pale in comparison to what can happen in your life when you open the living, breathing, active word of God. This Bible has the power to transform and benefit your life. The problem is this. The Bible is huge. And, and if you've spent much time in it, it's easy to get lost. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of sections in this Bible that if, if you don't have a background or, or clarity around, it is easy to be confused. It's easy to misunderstand. It's easy to misinterpret what is going on. It's intimidating. Parts of this book are offensive. They offend the things that I want with my life. They're the, they offend the ways that I wanna live. And they offend things that, that I see or am told out there that I should believe. It, it, it's uncomfortable to dig into. And, and, and if I, even if I know that it's gonna benefit my life, knowing how to read it, when to start, where to start reading, and how to understand it can be a huge, huge task. There are many wrong ways to approach the Bible, and when you approach it the wrong way, you can misinterpret, misunderstand, and completely miss the God that it's writing about. Growing up, my friend uh, had one of these. I don't know if you've ever seen this, and I'm gonna get an email about this. It's voodoo, okay. Uh, it's crazy called an eight ball fortune teller. But it's basically these, they give you an answer of yes, no, or maybe. But you know, you play the games and be like, ah, does Katie have a crush on me? My sources say yes. <laughs> I like your sources. Like, am I going to make the all-star team this year? Ask again later. All right, there's hope, right? <laughs> Or I always wanted to know, like, am I going to be rich when I grow up? No, stop asking. Okay. <laughs> it's fair. Sometimes we can approach the Bible in this way where we're hoping that we can just open to any spot and just that God's going to be this genie in a bottle that answers the exact question we've got at the exact time that we want. He's, he's going to give us the exact answer for our exact situation because that's what he does and that, that's what this word is full of. And if you've ever played that game where you've asked God a specific question and you've opened and then just pointed out, maybe it's worked for you. Maybe that's the case. But I, I thought we'd have some fun this morning and maybe, maybe there was a time where I could ask God, like, God, what do you want me to do with my future and my career, and you open, and, and maybe you would come across Ezekiel 4.15, if you've never heard this verse. Uh, it, says, it says this, all right, the Lord said, you may bake your bread with cow dung instead of human dung. <laughs> this, is, this is in the Bible, okay? So again, I just want you to know, I'm just preaching out of the word of God today. All right, but I, I don't know about you, but like when I open to this and I don't have the context of what's going on, I'm just, out, now I have more questions, yeah. right? Yeah. I've got, so God, do you want me to open a bakery? Um, <laughs> interesting recipe. Um, are, the, are the cows grass-fed? Uh, 
I don't know, organic seems to be a thing. No, I'm, I'm kidding. There is so much that we can grab out of context and miss what God's word is about, who he is about, and we can miss him. And so if the Bible can transform and benefit our life, yet it's so easy to study it in the wrong way and miss it, how do we go about that? And I wanna talk about that today, but first I kinda wanna be vulnerable with you and just share some of my process and experience with, with this book. I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. The Bible was not just something that our family knew about. We shaped our life and our direction as a family around it. I was raised in a, in a school, it was like a homeschool tutorial that was built on a Christian education. The Bible was the foundation of my education. At some point through high school, I have read through the entire book just academically. I have been exposed to the Bible my whole life and I was passionate about it and Jesus transformed my life and so I started following Jesus and I even went into ministry. But even on into my adult years, what I found is, again, this is a huge book and it can be intimidating. So what I would do is I would stick to the places that were most comfortable. I would stick to the sections of scripture that I felt like I could best understand. And when there was stuff that just brought more questions and fear, I'd just kind of pretend that wasn't there or quickly move past it and not really dig in to understand more of who God was. And as a result, I ended up having a lackluster effort with my Bible reading. Like just being honest with you, even as a pastor, it wasn't a priority. Four times a week was yes, but probably more as part of my job and less as a dependency in my life where it was something I absolutely needed out of the gate. I needed time with God. And it was about five years ago that I had a mentor that challenged me on my walk with God based on my dependency of this book. It challenged me to say, you, you do believe that the God of the universe made this possible so that you could learn about who he is. And it's got answers for him, what life is all about, and answers for you. You believe that this is the most important book on the planet. Yes. Well, your time and your effort doesn't show that you believe that this is the most important thing. And, and like the Holy Spirit used that mentor and that time for me to get serious about making time to dig into God's word and to begin studying it on a serious level, that was about five years ago. I've read through the Bible each year since then, and I've gotta tell you, like, the Lord has used the Bible so much more in the last five years than the other 25 plus years of my life prior to that. It does have the power to transform and benefit your life, and as your pastor, and as your brother, and as your friend, I want you to know something. I pray often, I pray often, that God would give you a hunger for this book. I pray often that God would give you a hunger for this book because it delivers. In 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3, it says this, you've had a taste of God. Now like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness, then you'll grow up and mature whole in God. It, and other translations say drink deep, uh, drink deep the the milk of God's word, the milk of God's word. There were sections of my life where I had had a taste. And if I could go back to like 20 year old Kevin, I'd be like, dude, I know you think you know, but you've only had a taste. And I bet you 10 years from now, I'd come back to this Kevin and be like, dude, you've only had a taste. This book is endless and it is powerful. And I promise you, if the only dose that you are getting of it is here on Sunday mornings, my encouragement to you as we dig in today is you're only getting a taste. It's so much better than that. My goal as a pastor when I preach is not that I would fill you with a meal. My goal is to give you a taste so that you go get hungry and dig in and get the meal yourself. This word is available to you every single moment of every single day. And so today, what I wanna talk about is how we study this Bible. If there's ways to do it wrong, what do I wish? Like if I could go back five years ago, I'd give myself three tips as I'm getting serious about studying it daily. Three tips that I think will help you, that help me, and they're good reminders. 
They're, they're things that I have to come back to because even as I've grown in the discipline of studying God's word, I can get off base on these three things and begin studying it the wrong way. Just because I'm in it every day doesn't mean that I st like stay on path to doing it the right way. I can kind of drift. So these three are reminders. So no matter what your level of experience is with the Bible, whether you have no experience reading the Bible or whether you've been reading it your whole life, I think God's got something for all of us today. So number one, Number one, prioritize quality over quantity. Prioritize quality over quantity. There's a quote that says that reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. And research kind of shows that. You could look at like successful people based on wealth and you would find that 88% of wealthy people in America are regular readers. They read on a regular basis. Mark Twain said that a person who won't read has no advantage over a person who can't read. And if you're in the room and you're a leader, you may have heard this quote by Harry Truman, who said that not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. All leaders are readers. Reading can have a huge benefit on our mind, just like physical exercise can have a benefit on our body and, and on our physical health. And I've, I've grown to, to love to read as an adult. I've grown to learn like this is a really uh, a, a strong way to grow. It's an advantage as a leader. It's a way that I can continue to be filled up and pour out into others. There's a lot of great material out there, but I didn't used to be that way with reading. In fact, in high school, I did everything I could to not read, all right? I, I went straight to, like if there was a paper or a test, my default was Cliff Notes and Spark Notes, period, all right? When it came to reading books and the assignments that I was given, especially if it was under crunch time and I had to read fast, I didn't feel like it really did me much good to read anyways, because what I'd find is I would speed through and I would read every bit, but I can go like pages and even chapters of reading and my mind is in la-la land. You ever do that? Like my mind's just gone. And someone will ask, well, what did you just read? And I have no idea. I, I don't, is it Tuesday? I don't even know where I am. I literally, I've just like drifted off into space. And this is what can happen so easy. And so I've learned the more that I've read that there's two great questions I have to ask before I read anything, whether I'm reading a leadership book or, or something that maybe Pastor Greg has recommended to me. Two questions. And this, this is just, this is, this is pro tips for you if, if you're getting into reading. Number one, what did I learn? Number two, what am I gonna do about it? Two simple questions that help me so much when I'm reading. What did I learn and what am I going to do about it? That helps me to really take the information and not just let it sit in my mind and go in one ear, out the other. It allows me to kind of transfer it into my actions and into my heart the same the same principle is true when it comes to reading the Bible. That I need to slow down sometimes and really pay attention to asking God, like, what am I learning here? God, what am I learning about you? And, and what do you want me to do with the information that I am learning? Because there are times where I can be reading the Bible and I can be flying through and just grabbing academic information in my head, but completely missing the journey that God wants to make into my lifestyle and my actions, which will affect my heart. And so for me, there's a couple of Psalms that are helpful when I get into Bible reading that I love to pray. Psalm 119, 18 says this, open my eyes that I may see wonderful truths in your instruction. It's just a heart posture to say, God, I'm not just reading this to read this. I'm showing up with my heart. I want, I want to learn wonderful things from your instructions. And then Psalm 119, 24, your laws please me. They give me wise advice. They give me wise advice. Lord, I'm like trusting that what I learn is going to impact my life and I want to put this into action. What did I learn? What did I learn about you, God? And what am I gonna do about it? There's been times with, with reading the Bible that maybe I've been walking through a plan with others and if I get behind, 
I, I can kind of feel the pressure of, okay, I gotta catch up. Now, now I'm like three days behind, everybody's soaring past me, I no longer fit in, or even if I'm doing a plan on my own and I'm not with other people, I just feel like once I'm behind, I'm like, ah, I gotta catch up to, to get going and I get into a speed reading mode and as soon as that happens, I start to miss the whole point and what I found, like if I could go back five years, what I found that I, I would remind myself is some of the most powerful moments that I've had in reading the Bible only took one verse or even one word. That God can use one verse or one word to stop me in my tracks, to cause me to learn something amazing about him, to cause me to evaluate what he wants me to do with that information in my own life. And I can sit with that and God can do a quality work and it won't be about how much I read or how many pages or chapters or books I read. And going through it as a checklist isn't what impacts our life. The quality that we put our hearts into this is what will allow this, this book to transform and benefit your life. So prioritize quality over quantity. Now, there are plenty of days that I go with the right posture and the right heart and the right attitude and it still feels stale. It still feels like I didn't really experience anything out of this, God. I'm not sure if you're there or working and that's where point two or tip two today comes in. Number two, be patient and persistent. Be patient and persistent. I love this verse in Isaiah 55. It says this, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. Other translations say that my word never returns void. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. There are certain days where I do give the right heart posture but I feel like I'm just not connecting with God and it's good to be reminded that God's timing is not my timing. God has a timing and a schedule to how he's working. And, and I, my, the goal in my relationship with God is not to get God to bend to my schedule and my will. It's for me to bend to his schedule and his will. And part of that requires me to trust, to trust what his word says that, hey, just because I didn't have this huge, overwhelming, emotional experience or aha moment with God today, if I was in his word, he says that it will bear fruit. And so I'm gonna trust him on that. And it may not come to fruition today, but his word comes to fruition. That is something he says. And as I've looked back over the last five years, I can see, wow, God, like there was sections that I had questions about that I didn't understand. And it wasn't until three months later that I was reading something else that I remembered and was like, holy cow, God, I'm seeing the big picture of what you were showing. And, and I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had this delivery in this moment with this fruit had I not been diligent in staying after reading back in that phase where I was and where you had me reading. Being patient to allow God's scripture to come to fruition on his time, but persistent to keep showing up, trusting that it's always working. A few years back, uh, my dad gifted us, we were, we were helping him move, and he gifted us with a really nice grill that, that smokes meat. And so we had had a propane grill, but this was, uh, this was also, it was a big green egg. And like, we, we, I was helping my dad move, and he's like, I've had this thing for three years, I've fired it up, I think, once. Like, if you can get buddies to move it, do you want it? And I'm like, yeah, like, I definitely want it. I got buddies there, like, immediately, and we moved that thing. And so I had never, I had never done any of this. Uh, I never smoked barbecue or anything. And so I started doing a lot of research. I, I went and bought my first pork shoulder and I was stoked. I mean, I researched a lot about the best method for cooking this thing low and slow because I wanted the meat to be perfect, okay? And I, I'm looking up the best spices and rubs and how early I need to get those set up. I'm looking up the type of wood that I need. And, and like, there are so many ways. This is really, it's an art. It's an art, and so I, and I'm an artist, so I was excited. Like, this was, this was a blast getting it all ready, and so it was, a, uh, it was an early Saturday morning. It was a college football Saturday that I got up. I mean, it's still dark out. It's like 5 a.m., 
I got the grill going. I got the pork shoulder in there. Bama game's not until uh, seven that night. And I start cooking and I'm just stoked. I'm like, I feel proud. This is awesome. It's gonna be the best pork ever. Can't wait. I feel like a man. Anyways, um, so it's cooking. And what, what you wanna do with the pork is you wanna get it to uh, about like between 190 and 200 degrees internal temperature. And then if you've done that and you've like cooked it slow, I don't know, there's probably people in the room that have way more experience than me in this, but it, it really starts to fall apart. It's like the perfect, you really want that meat kind of falling apart when you get ready to shred it. And so the, the internal temperature starts scooting pretty quick, way quicker than I had anticipated. So it's only been a couple hours and we're already getting close to like 150 degrees. And so I'm thinking, wow, I'm gonna finish this thing like way early. Um, I mean, I guess that'll be good. I can eat it all day, but I was kind of like planning on what I thought would, how long I thought it would take. I'd research like based on the size of the pork, how long it's gonna take. And as it approached and it hit 150 degrees internally, it kind of stopped moving. And, and then like an hour later, I, I'm, I'm checking again and it's still sitting at 150 degrees internally. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's interesting. And I kind of move on. I got plenty of time, not, not stressed yet. Hour later, it's still sitting at 150 degrees. Hour four, it's still sitting at 150 degrees. And now I'm like, okay, I'm checking the fire. Like everything's good. It's at the temperature that it, I was told to cook it at. So I'm confused and I start looking up and I start finding out information that I didn't find in my research, which is that when you cook low and slow a pork shoulder or a brisket, what you will hit is this stage called the stall. And what happens in this phase of cooking is the internal temperature stops moving because the meat is really breaking down. It's like the best part where it's breaking down all of the, all of the fat and the collagen in the meat and it starts sweating. And as a result, as the meat sweats, it kind of keeps it stuck, but it's not, the, it's not still moving in the right direction. In fact, it's doing the, the stuff that you want, the stuff that helps that pork fall apart. And so there are plenty of ways to push through this stall. I'm reading about it. Like I can wrap it in aluminum foil and, and crank up the grill without totally ruining it. But everything I'm reading is like, no, if you want the best pork, you wait through the stall. And what it was telling me was that every single piece of meat has a different stall. There, like, there is some predictability, but the predictability is like, it could be one hour, it could be six hours, good luck. I mean, that's it. And so this is my first one. I've put a lot of time into it. I'm like, sorry, Katie, we're gonna wait as long as the stall goes. <laughs> we're just like, we're gonna ride this out. Like, we're in this far. I'm gonna find out like how good this pork's gonna be. Katie, you're a great sport. Um, seven o'clock comes, we're, we're still in the stall. And it's okay, uh, we watch Bama, we're starving. I'm mad, I'm not mad, I'm just hangry. And, but I'm happy too. It's like, this is gonna be the best pork we've ever had, I promise. <laughs> Finally, it starts moving, but not, not at the pace it did at the beginning. It was 12.30 that night. I was committed, I was committed. Pull the pork off, you gotta wait like 30 minutes to pull it to get the best flavor, so. Uh, Katie stayed up with me that night. This was before we had any of the girls, so. Uh, she stayed up with me. We had the best dinner date of our lives. <laughs> the pork may have been horrible, but to us, it was amazing. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Now, I give myself a lot more time when I'm gonna start cooking a pork shoulder. I give myself the room to, hey, let that thing ride because it is going to be incredible. Listen, in our faith, in our walk, in our, in our reading of the word, there are times where it may feel stale, but it's some of the best moments where God is working inside. And you, you may not feel it. You may not see all of the change that you're looking for in your life, but he's working. And you know what? He may be working in your life at a different pace than he's working at the person next to you. Because every single one of us are at a different part in our journey and he knows just what you need. He knows just what you need. And his word is going to come to fruition. 
It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. And so if I could go back, I would encourage myself, don't, don't be discouraged on the days where it feels like nothing's happening. Be patient and be persistent because this is the best part. This is where he's working out the best part. And then number three, and this is probably the most obvious, but it's also the most important. Don't forget to connect with God. Don't forget to connect with God. Again, it may seem so obvious, but there are so many times where we can dig into this word to gather information or make it strictly academic and we miss the whole point that this is God's letter out there so that we could find a relationship with him. This is the story of who he is and how we can reconnect with him through his one and only son, Jesus. This tells the story of who Jesus is, that Jesus came and died for our sins and that through him, we can have a connection with our perfect and holy creator. And the purpose of this word is to draw us to Jesus so that we can connect with God. The Pharisees were very studied on the Bible. They knew the Bible well, and they were even wanting the Bible to be the way they could connect with God. But Jesus called them out in John chapter 5, 39 and 40. He said, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me, Jesus is saying. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. These Pharisees knew of over 300 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that was coming. They were waiting, but they were so focused on the words that they missed the person. And he was right in front of them. And there are times, even as a follower of Jesus, there are times where I can dig in and I can get caught up and lost in the academics and forget that this is God's word to me. It's different than any other book. This isn't just an academic book that tells me history. This is, this is God's word for me to hear his heart and to connect with him. Don't forget to connect with God. Regularly studying the Bible will transform and benefit your life. But when it comes to actually putting that to practice and trying to study the word of God, it can be intimidating. It can be easy to misunderstand. It can be easy to misinterpret. And it can be easy to miss God. But I believe that if we really dig in and we focus on the quality rather than racing through and trying to finish the whole thing, if we focus on the quality, if we choose to be patient and persistent and trust the author who's behind it, and we focus on connecting with God, I think you can begin to develop a deep hunger and dependency on this word. A deep hunger and dependency on this word. I feel it when I miss it. There's a deep hunger and dependency. My, like my day, my schedule revolves, revolves around my need to make time to get to this because it's my connection time with God. It's a relational book. It's not just an informational book. This is the last tip. This isn't one of the points, but it's built on relationships. Something that I've found with relationships is you have to be intentional. Relationships do not grow on accident, especially as life gets busier. My wife, Katie, and I, as, as our lives are getting busier, as our girls have come into the world and they're getting older and their schedules are piling up, for us to grow in our relationship, it requires us to be intentional with one another. Before we had kids, it was easy to stay up till 1 a.m. cooking a pork butt. That's great. But now with kids going on a date and making time to, to, to pour into us and to have just us time in our relationship, it requires intentionality. We have to plan ahead. It's not gonna be just on a whim. We've gotta figure out a babysitter and we've gotta figure out how much time 
it's going to take. We've got to figure out, like, financially, what, what can we afford now? And what's that going to look like? We can't just, like, stumble into investing in our relationship. We have to, we have to be intentional. And for, for us, it works when we, like, we pick a time and we pick a place and we pick a plan. Those three things are super helpful for us. When we're intentional about picking a time, picking a place, and picking a plan. And I found that the same is true when it comes to me digging in to the word of God. That I'm, if I begin looking at this as a relationship and being intentional, what I'm finding is it's not gonna happen on accident with the leftovers. I'm too busy for that. You're too busy for that. There's too many things grabbing for our attention. There's too many things distracting us. But when I'm intentional to pick a time, pick a place, and pick a plan, it's huge. And I've got my time. I've got my spot in the mornings. My time in the mornings that I know that is for my time with God to connect with him. I've got a place in the house. It's my spot on the couch before the girls are up. And don't worry, there's plenty of coffee. I've got the coffee there. Coffee's gonna be hanging out with us, but I've got the time and I've got the place and I've got a Bible reading plan that, that helps me. Because sometimes just like opening it up, it doesn't always land. It doesn't always land, but that plan helps me to stay guided. And then God will, God will veer me away from that plan many times. He'll take me on a detour plenty of times. There'll be times that he wants me to stop once I've read one verse and, and we, we talk and we journal about it and it's relational. It's not, it's not a regimented, I'm gonna read two chapters every single day and set it down. It's a relationship that's yeah. built. Yes. Yeah. It requires intentionality. The scriptures they are not what give us life. They're the avenue for us to hear about Jesus who gives us life. And he is the only, the only way to connect with our creator. Church, I pray that God would give you a hunger, a hunger for this book that can transform and benefit your life. But even more than that, I pray that if any of you don't know Jesus, that you would find him that the story that this tells of a savior who loves you, who died for your sins, so that you could have eternal life and connect with a heavenly father who created you and is crazy about you and wants to fulfill every part of your heart that this world can't fulfill and won't fulfill. And so if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask him to be your savior. I'm gonna ask that we pray right now. And if that's you, you might just pray a prayer like this. Jesus. Jesus, I believe. I believe what this book claims. I believe that you are the one true way to a relationship with God. And God, I'm sorry for my sins that separated me from you. But Jesus, I thank you for taking the punishment of my sins on the cross. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. And so today, I wanna follow you. I want a relationship with you, God. I'm gonna commit to follow you from this day forward. And God, for my other brothers and sisters in this room, I just pray that you would give us a deep hunger for this incredible book that is unlike any other book. Give us a hunger for you. Give us a hunger to learn more about you, learn more about how we can connect with you. And God, that we would care about developing our godliness, developing our godlikeness more than any other habit in our life. I pray that today would be an inspiring day for my brothers and sisters in this room, that they would be inspired to figure out a way to schedule their time and their day around that opportunity to connect with you through your word, God. I pray that you would give them courage to pick a time, to pick a place, and to pick a plan. God, you're so good. You're so patient with us. You're so patient with us. And I just thank you for the, for the invitation that you give to relationship with you. No matter what we've got in our background or in our history, God. 
You don't show up to cast shame if we haven't been digging into the word before. It's not a checklist item or a prove it item. God, it's just an invitation to an awesome relationship filled with mercy, grace, and love. And so God, I do, I just pray today that there would be an invitation sent out and hunger would inspire us this week to see that your word is good. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, what an awesome yes. message. It's been great being a part of this Bible Explained series. I feel like it's been super mm -hmm. practical. But if today was the day that you took your next step, you decided to give your life to Jesus, we want to know about it. We want to celebrate with you, and we want to walk you through your next step. So let us know at foothills.cc slash connect. You'll see it on the screen right here. But again, we want to celebrate with you. We want to walk alongside of you and we want to know that you gave your life to Jesus today. Yeah. Also, we'd love to stay connected. So maybe you want, uh, you have some questions about how you can serve or maybe you have just some prayer requests and you would love for someone from our staff to reach out to you. Let us know there as well on that foothills.cc slash connect. We also have our podcast season two that has kicked back off. If you have missed those, definitely go back on Spotify or YouTube, one of our platforms and re-listen or re-watch those. We have some work that's going to be coming your way. They've been awesome. I love the stories that we've, we've gotten had into so some far. deep yes. stories for the beginning of the season They've and we've got great. more to come. So. Yes. And so we will see you guys back here next week. We hope you have a fabulous week. See ya.